Good afternoon. Let's talk about Macbeth. If you're in year nine and you haven't started Macbeth yet, then now is quite a good time to maybe research a little bit about the play online or ask parents if they've heard of it. A Google search will come up with something quite quickly. You could find an animated version of the play, perhaps, or a quick um, breakdown of the story of the play. It's really good. We will come back to it when you come back to school. Have some fun in the theatre with it. Year 10, now, you've got Macbeth as your homework on GCSE pod. And you're revising the key themes, the characters, the ideas, the storyline, the plot, everything that Shakespeare's trying to achieve through the play. I wanted to talk to you very quickly today about propaganda in Macbeth. Now, on one hand, it's a play about the supernatural, isn't it? It's a play about Duncan being killed, about good and evil, light and dark, Macbeth's ambition, his hamartia, his destructive nature, how he allows his desires to destroy everything and it eventually leads to a terrible, terrible, chaotic misery in, across Scotland where for, for years, I think, the people live in a, in a terrible state of chaos and, and unrest. But who saves them? Who saves them? This is the propaganda. Shakespeare's writing 500 years ago at a time when James I is on the throne. Maybe not 500 years, but almost. James I is on the throne. He is the first king to be king of Scotland and England. And he thinks he's great. You know, he's a glorious man. The previous king was Elizabeth I, who actually had his mother, Mary, Queen of Scots, executed. James I sees himself as this as this great, glorious king who can bring together the kingdoms of Scotland and England and be one of the greatest monarchs of all time. Shakespeare has to be very careful that everything in the play matches up with what James I thinks and believes in. Otherwise, it's off with your head. Off with your head, easily. Shakespeare could have been done for. So everything he writes about needs to be in James's favour. If you look at, it on, look at this online, you'll see that Banquo is probably, in real life, um, one of James I's, James I is one of his descendants, I've lost my vocabulary, James I is one of his descendants um, and therefore Banquo needs to be painted in a very positive light, which he is. I think in real life the, the real Banquo wasn't quite so favourable. Anyway, briefly looking at how England is presented in the play. England is presented to us as a heroic nation. Scotland, poor Scotland, bleed, bleed, poor country. Every day a new gash is added to its wounds. Scotland suffers. Scotland can't even save itself from its own trauma. Scotland can't even save itself from Macbeth. But who can? The English can, because the English are brilliant, aren't they? And that's the propaganda in Macbeth in the play. Shakespeare has to present the English as these great warriors, these great heroes that can save Scotland from its terrible fate. And where several places this appears in the play, in ways that it probably didn't need to to be at all. It's just there for propaganda. When Macduff goes to England in search of Malcolm to, to raise the English army, who again come with their 10,000 men to de-seat Macbeth, to unseat him and to to save Scotland from the terror, the, England, the English are the saviours. Now, Malcolm describes kings as being full of justice, verity, temperance, stableness, bounty, perseverance, mercy, lowliness, devotion, patience, what a long list, courage, fortitude. That's really a reflection of what James I considers himself to be. You're a great King James. You're a man of courage. You're a man of devotion. You're a man of temperance and a man of mercy, unlike Macbeth. It's really a, a piece of flattery for the king. That's in Act 4, Scene 3. And then Malcolm, I think this bit's quite amusing, Malcolm talks um, to Macduff and to the doctor of having seen how the King of England saves people with his curing, healing hands. In Act 4, Scene 3, he says, A most miraculous work in this good King, which often, since my here remain in England, I have seen him do. How he solicits heaven himself best knows. And then he talks about how the King of England goes around curing people and almost being like Jesus with his healing hands. And that's not really necessary. Creates a good contrast against the monster Macbeth, but also is another massive piece of flattery for James I. 
And finally, at the end of the play, when Malcolm is crowned, he says, oh, and also, by the way, Thames, let's call you earls. We'll stop calling you Thames. Thames means lord. We'll call you an earl. Now, earls are English. What he's saying is, let's all try and unite. At the time, the play was set, not written, set. Scotland is an entirely different nation, completely different nation to England. There's no relationship between the two. Really, they're enemies. James I, being the monarch of both, gives him this precedence and suggests as well that England is, is the dominant force, the dominant power. So by making all the Scottish Thanes earls at the end of the play, we're again given that propaganda that England is the better nation, the stronger nation. England offers the way forward. So don't just look for the story. Don't just look for what Macbeth does. Let's look at the way the countries, the nations are presented and how Macbeth is a really good piece of propaganda to try and push and deliver this idea that James I is the best king England has ever had. Look out for more instalments on Macbeth from other teachers coming soon.